Welcome to Tucker Carlson today. So a company called FTX blew up several weeks ago. FTX was something called a cryptocurrency exchange, sort of. It was related in ways most people don't understand to the cryptocurrency business. It exploded in what apparently was the largest fraud in the history of money ever. Billions of dollars disappeared overnight. And in that collapse, it discredited in the minds of many the whole concept of cryptocurrency. And that would include Bitcoin. People are using that collapse. In fact, some of the people who should have prevented it, some of the regulators who should have been on top of it before the guy who ran it walked off with the money of lots of different investment funds. Those people are using the collapse of FTX to further regulate the entire space of cryptocurrency. Is that a good idea? What exactly is going on here? What was FTX? What's the future of cryptocurrency and Bitcoin in particular? There's probably nobody better to talk this subject than Max Kaiser, a financial journalist, author of The Book of Max, one of the earliest investors in Bitcoin and to this day what they call a Bitcoin maximalist. Max, thanks so much for coming on. Tucker, it's great to be here. And you're right, there's a lot of confusion now, Bitcoin and crypto and what's happening with FTX. Uh, but when the case of Bitcoin, it's designed to be attacked and it's designed to be disruptive. Uh, we brought with you today, I've got here this wonderful Bitcoin grenade as a gift <laughs> Good. for well, you. I accept all weapons. Yeah. And, Thank you. Uh, to really get, drive home the point that Bitcoin is designed to disrupt the financial system, the fiat money system. And the way it's designed, Tucker, is that the more you try to attack it, the stronger it gets. Because the way to attack it is to throw computational power at it, which enhances those to continue to mine it, which means that the hash rate, which is the underlying algorithm that gives it its power, gets stronger, which means it gets more secure, and therefore the price goes higher. So it's actually, it's a unique piece of technology that people either love it or hate it. It's almost like a litmus test. If you're essentially a corrupt individual, you become more corrupt, like Sam Bankman-Fried. He was born a corrupt individual. Bitcoin made him more corrupt. If you're somebody who's more noble with intentions, like a Michael Saylor, it elevates you to greater heights of what was underlying a noble instinct. And Bitcoin has the power to do that. And so what we're seeing now is really Another chapter in the history of Bitcoin where the traditional finance is imploding. Uh, the central banks are nervous. The central banks are having hearings. The, Christine Lagarde is quite upset because she says that Bitcoin is an escape hatch. And of course, she's right because you're escaping the central bank system, the fiat money system, with money that allows people to have unconfiscatable property that's on completely outside of the current system. And that scares people. If you have a population owning unconfiscatable property that cannot be assailed by any authority, it's completely decentralized. And, and that's why it's causing the shock waves around the world. Well, they've always hated it for that reason. Yes. That is the promise of Bitcoin. You work, you buy something that you actually own that's not subject to the whims of whatever political system you live under. And that's a very appealing idea, I think, to people who watch our systems in collapse, which they are now collapsing. But explain, if you would, in a way that viewers can understand, non-specialists, the difference between what Sam Bankman-Fried was doing, he was in the crypto space, he said, and what you're talking about, which is also in the minds of most in the crypto space. How are they different? Right. So Sam Bankman-Fried, the key to his empire of fraud is that he created his own play money token called FTT. And he was able to create that without any oversight or any uh, tie to anything underlying um, it, giving it value whatsoever. And this is a whole cryptographic scam that's been going on with the crypto market where individuals, and he's not the only one, there are many people that create these what are called altcoins or scam coins. And they create, uh, Ether is another one, or Cardano or XRP, these are all uh, coins that are just created and then they list these coins on each other's exchange and then they buy them from each other to create a price and then they use the enhanced price which is now as a collateral value to go buy something like Sam Bankman Fried did real estate in the Bahamas. Right. Right. So it's a Ponzi scheme. It's a fraud. So they're converting. It's alchemy. They're converting air Total. 
into real property. The, the closest analogy I'll give you would be in 2008 during the financial crisis, the ability of Wall Street banks to create derivatives and right. mortgage-backed securities. Right. So they were simply taking something, a plain vanilla mortgage, and then they were rehypothecating it and repackaging it and creating digital um, financial alchemy to make something that was worthless have a, a quotable value, and then using that as collateral to float more derivatives. And as Chuck Prince of Citibank said at the time, this will continue until the music stops. Well, guess what? The music stopped and the whole house of cards collapsed. And the central bank, who was really responsible for the whole thing by making money so cheap to fund the scam, came in and made money even cheaper. So instead of there being any accountability, instead of there be people going to jail, like William K. Black during the 1970s SNL crisis sent a thousand bankers to jail. And what they did in America was instead of making that particular type of fraud illegal, they simply changed the laws to make it so that it, it was not never going to be prosecuted again. And it opened the door in the 1980s for all kinds of other scams, which then led to the 2008 crisis and the current crisis we have today. We have laws in the books, Tucker, but we don't have anyone enforcing those laws. Laws. And implied in the Sam Bankman Free crisis uh, scam is none other than Gary Gensler over at the SEC, who should have been calling time on this a long ago, but we find out that he's actually involved and that there's some what I would call collusion. And the problem is in America, you have a country that's ruled by a kleptocracy. Every institution in America is tied to Wall Street in some way. They've all been financialized. They all use cheap money. They're all cross collateraling each other's assets. They're all using that money to buy real assets. And they're all undermining the economy in fundamental ways, which lead to inflation, which lead to unemployment, which lead to all kinds of dysfunctions in the economy, in our medical system, in all across the institutions. It all goes back to essentially the deregulation that happened 40 years ago, which led to the financialization and the over-indebtedness, the over-leveraging of the economy. And now, in 2022, since interest rates are going up, that's the end of the mirage, that the bubble has been popped. And if the FTX scandal and the Sam bankman fried scandal was like the last dregs of a 40-year bacchanal in cheap money, no regulation, and crooked bankers. I I have no background in any of the areas you're describing, but just as a as a watcher of what's happened over that period, I sense everything you say is true. You worked within that system for a while. Did you give us a quick right? Summary so of I your started background. in the 1982 on Wall Street as a stockbroker. I worked there for for eight years. I worked at Payne Weber. I worked at Oppenheimer. I worked at Sherson Lehman Hutton. I worked at Alex Brown and Company. And um, so I had a front row seat during a period in financial history in America where a lot of innovation, so-called, was, was brought to fore because of the appearance in the 70s, late 70s, of the discount brokers. So what happened is to, for Wall Street to compete with the discounts, like the Charles Schwab's right, and others, right. they went on a spree of inventing products. And they went uh, and they created, for example, Mike Milken and junk bonds. That was a way to grab back some revenue from they were losing it to the discounters. So they created the leverage buyout, became huge. And in America, you had the corporate raiders who came in, Carl Icahn and others who went to Mike Milken, and they borrowed tons of money, and they bought assets, and then they stripped those assets. And so Wall Street was let loose, in, in effect. And Alan Greenspan at the time at the Fed was saying, well, you know, my job is not really price stability anymore. My job is to service Wall Street. Anytime they get in trouble, I'm going to make interest rates cheaper, and I'm going to bail out Wall Street. That was the new mandate for the Fed, and that's, they call it the Greenspan put. And they, and, and they loved him for it. I remember it very well. But why do you think Greenspan, who was smart, who's still alive, by the way, uh, who is smart, why do you think he did that? Well, later on in retirement, he, he said publicly that he regrets now, and he looks back, and he said he was wrong, uh, that the idea of simply throwing the keys uh, to, of the castle to Wall Street and letting them do whatever they wanted to do was, was incorrect. But at the time, remember, Alan Greenspan was doing ads for Apple Computer, and he was a media figure. Yes. And so he was very egocentrically driven to have the attention drawn to him. He was not like Paul Volcker, who preceded him, who took rates up to 16 to 17 percent uh, to wipe out the inflation that was the result of the Vietnam War and all the profligate spending in the U.S. So he became a celebrity. And this was the first time, really, you had financiers become celebrities. 
Flash forward to Ben Bernanke and Hank Paulson and the financial crisis, where they're on the cover of Time magazine as saving the world by uh, in the 2008 crisis with Timothy Geithner was atrocious. A chapter in, in American financial history where laws were broken and rewritten uh, on the fly, uh, where Hank Paulson put a gun to Congress' head and said, give us uh, $780 billion right now or we're going to crash the market. And the next day, the markets did start to crash. And then Congress said, oh, sorry, yeah, we'll give you your money. So they their whole... Uh, the Congress hostage because they can manipulate prices. It's very, very easy. Uh, my experience on Wall Street, will, I can tell you, and having invented a technology, the virtual specialist technology, which is patent number 59501176, it's a way to make virtual markets. And I can tell you, and it was bought by Cantor Fitzgerald in 2001. And um, it's a, it, I can tell you technologically how to, how to manipulate markets using algorithms quite easily to create the prices you want. The markets today, Tucker, are not the result of buyers and sellers coming together and creating a market price. It's That's what we imagine. It's the result of, so let's say, a Goldman Sachs saying, we want the price to be X, so we're going to fill the trades in to get to X. So they determine the prices in advance that they want to see. Well, that's not a real market. No, it's a command and control system. It's central planning. It's not capitalism at all. Don't blame, don't blame capitalism for the ills of the American economy because we don't live in a capitalist society. We live in a command and control society where the fundamental element of the economy, money, the price of that money is set by the Central Committee, the Politburo, known as the federal, uh, the FOMC. That's not a market-driven economy. Uh, so that's a problem number one. Bitcoin solves this because Bitcoin is not controlled by anyone. It is pure market-driven. And the price of Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin is dictated purely by people's um, willingness to have or, want or need to have an unconfiscatable, uncensorable f way to, f uh, to own property outside of what they see as a, a very big corrupt system. Now, you had Michael Saylor on your show who did a very great explanation about how Bitcoin beats inflation. You know, what I would add to it is that Bitcoin beats the kleptocracy. Bitcoin beats the, the inherent fraud and and the problems in the U.S. economy as it has now descended into what would almost be argued a permanent state of dysfunction by a, a, a captured regulators, uh, venal, uh, ineffective politicians, and um, a media, uh, present company excluded, but a media that's in also in their pocket as well. So we have a, really a crisis. So I want to ask you to pause there, and I, I want to play you a montage that we put together that I... I watch even in my spare time because it's just, it, this needs to be recorded somehow on the blockchain so it's never lost. <laughs> this is the response to Sam Bankman Fried, who I think before I play this, we would both agree was like a transparent fraud, like obvious, right? Yes. Right. So no normal person, other than I guess Sequoia, would ever give money to a guy who plays video games during interviews, right? <laughs> but here's how he was treated by the US media, financial media. They call him the JP Morgan of crypto, right? Yeah, <laughs> the Michael Jordan of crypto, if you will. <laughs> so why should you care about a floppy-haired, yeah, vegan, like fidget-spinning crypto billionaire who occasionally sleeps on a beanbag chair? During the so-called crypto winter, the 30-year-old CEO has been referred to as crypto's white knight. JP Morgan of this generation, Sam Bankman Fried's FTX. Is he the Jay Gould of our era or is he the JP Morgan of our era? I think it's yet to be determined. Yet to be determined. Is he, the, is he Vanderbilt? He could be. Is he Harriman? Possibly. Is he the Credit Mobile scandal? Is he Carnegie? If he gives a lot of libraries, he is. We spend all our time in my world making fun of the political press because it's so inept and partisan. But it, the financial press, it's, you've dealt with your whole life. I mean, what is that? It's the worst. The financial press is much worse. Uh, <laughs> That's so sad. It be, and not only that, but it's openly telegraphing to the other, the, the financial community, the frauds that they're conducting, how the frauds are doing, and how you can participate in those frauds. Like the Financial Times is essentially a, a Bible on committing financial fraud. The Wall Street Journal is essentially the playbook on how to commit financial fraud. Um, the typical financial media at CNBC really talk about fraud. There's nothing inherently... Uh, with any integrity whatsoever in these financial markets. Uh, but to your point, 
with the coverage of Sam Bankman Fried, here you have a situation where this is, by the way, Sam, uh, his company, FTX, was launched the same day as, as Biden launched his presidential campaign. I don't know if you know that, but it was a bit of a coincidence there. But so so I, I didn't know that. And, and so yeah. that would have been 2000, late 2019 yeah. at some point. So, so it's now 2022. So in three years, he made billions of dollars. How do you do that? Well, you do it by, as I explained a little bit earlier. So let's dig into this. After Bitcoin was created, a lot of people decided that they could come up with digital currencies that were going to... Be, that, that could uh, be used uh, as scams. Essentially, they're, they're, it was very easy to create play money. And I did this myself, as I mentioned, in the 1990s when I did the Hollywood Stock Exchange, I created a virtual currency as part of that game. So I know this market very, very well. And so I can tell you intimately in detail from a technological point of view, the ins and outs of these frauds that are being perpetrated. And these tokens that are being created but in the trillions, they have their their purpose is solely to be uh, picked up by this cartel, if you will, of VCs uh, out in California, uh, Sequoia. You mentioned as part of it, uh, and others who are involved in um, a, um, a a collusion in, in in racketeering. This is the thing about it, Tucker, is that they're involved in a clear cut case of criminal enterprise. It's a criminal enterprise. It's a racket. They need to be going after it with RICO. Uh, the Andreessen Horowitz, Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, Sequoia, BlackRock, they're involved in a criminal enterprise and a racket by boosting the price of worthless tokens on each other's exchanges and then using that token as collateral to fund things like, oh, the war machine in Ukraine. Oh, Joe Biden's re-election campaign. Oh, the midterms, which we now know was highly influenced by money that was manufactured out of thin air. They can't get the money from Congress. They can't get the money from their donors. So they created this entity called FTX, which is a huge slush fund. Essentially, it's a slush fund disguised as a crypto exchange, which is managed by somebody. I, I, the way I see Sam Bankman Fried, he's kind of a cross between Bernie Madoff and Charles Manson. Right, because he's got his little cadre of drug addled sex maniacs in the Bahamas, and he's perpetrating the biggest uh, Ponzi scheme in history. So imagine that the mix of Charles Manson and, and Bernie Madoff, and you end up with this freaky, fuzzy haired, uh, larcenistic <laughs> criminal who's down there perpetrating the biggest fraud in history. And there the Democrats are like, yeah, I'll take your money because we're morally uh, in need. It doesn't matter what the money is stolen. Our moral agenda means that we can take stolen money because we're, that's the way we are. We need to fight over there in Ukraine. We need to make all the, you know, the, you know, the moral turpitude of the Democrats is insanely over the top. So, but they, they've run out of money. So they had to resort to this, essentially this racket and the racket, you can go back and you can trace the origins of it to the past few decades where we've had very similar instances of financial fraud and abuse, the 2008 crisis I mentioned, the SNL crisis, long-term capital management, if you remember that, the late 90s, they were engaged in a massive uh, scheme, really, Ponzi scheme, that blew up and uh, they were bailed out by the Fed. The, the, the hope is always that the Fed will bail you out. The hope is always that the financiers will bail you out, that there will be no accountability. And the question is, well, why wouldn't they have that assumption? Because when in the last 40 years have these financiers not gotten bailed out? When has the, any of them gone to jail? Okay, Bernie Madoff, we can, okay, he went to jail. But we're talking about literally thousands of people who, if they were properly prosecuted, would be in jail, as William K. Black did in the early 1980s against the uh, SNL crisis. It might be before your time, but remember the Keating Five, Charles yes, Keating? Yes, of course. All those people were engaged in the um, essentially mismarketing uh, certificates of deposits at savings banks and then using that as collateral to go buy yachts and property. And it was a very similar scam, but a rudimentary version of it. So all we've seen in the last 40 years is they're getting worse and worse. The, the remedy for the 2008 crisis was not to try to put the bad guys in jail. What Bernanke did was they, allowed, they gave him a credit card 10 times bigger and said, just do the exact same thing. Obama, same thing. They said, we're not going to put you in jail. But Obama said, don't focus on the past. 
Don't focus on the past. We're going to look to the future. So we're going to give the guys who committed these crimes 10 times to 20 times the credit, and they're going to do the, exactly the same thing. Now, what, at that time, we said within 10 to 12 years, the exact same thing is going to happen, but 10 times worse. And that's where we're at today. We were off by two years. 14 years later, it's the global financial crisis part two. And it's because of the exact same things happening all over again. Um, I wrote, the, you know, remember collateralized mortgage-backed securities? For Very well, okay. yes. There's a new product just this past week. It's called private equity-backed securities. <laughs> so they're taking worthless private equity <laughs> they're wrapping it in a new. I'm product. adding that to the list of things I'm not investing in. No, but they, they've already sold, you know, half a billion to a billion of it, because what is it? It's it's a private equity back note where they're taking the stubs from busted private equity deals that are to completely illiquid, and that's what I said. If you read the Wall Street Journal, it's like you're reading a how-to book on how to commit fraud. Here it is. Illiquid private equity stakes bundled into a security known as a collateralized fund obligation with a high credit rating, of course, because they put a little treasury in there to give it a, it's like reverse drug dealing. You know, you put in a treasury uh, bill to make your garbage seem higher. It's called a CFO, collateralized debt obligations. Uh, and so they've already sold billions of these. Who would buy something like that? Pension accounts. Because pension accounts are, in our country, the people who run them, are picked by Wall Street, and they pick stupid people on purpose. <laughs> I'm, I'm now, when I was on Wall Street, this is truth. If I had a trade, let's say I had a trade that I made, and I had like a half a million dollar or a million dollar error on that trade. We do, you stick it in the error account for the firm. There's no account number. So you don't really recognize it as existing. But you know on the books of the firm, there's a big error. Then a week later, you're talking to the teacher's pension account, or the fireman's pension account, it's a huge pool of money, it's run by an idiot. And you say, okay, it's time to top up the pension account, we're, we're dumping a bundle of securities into the pension account, into that bundle goes that bad trade. It's a loss, but they just bundle it in, and they make it disappear. And the pension accounts are always underperforming the market because Wall Street uses pension accounts as a toxic waste dump. They have for decades. I myself, but those are people's retirement accounts. Uh, but they, uh, unfortunately, have no one representing them on Wall Street, except for some idiot that's handpicked by Wall Street. Robert Citrone is in the case of a pension manager, if you go back and look it up, who was caught, you know, for a, it's easy to get a guy like that to do your bidding. You know, you, you show up, you've got your nice suit from Wall Street. He's a schlub in the middle of nowhere. You go to the local strip bar, you buy him a cocktail, and he's going to put a half a billion dollars worth of shit, in the, excuse me, into the pension account uh, because he's an idiot. And he's a purpose, he's a useful idiot. And that's the pension account, that's the pension business in America. Why are pensions underperforming? Why is there a pension crisis in America? Because Wall Street uses it as a waste dump. That's truth. That's the way it is. And the idea is that if they, if they implode, then they're effectively backed by, They'll the, get bailed out. by the Congress. They'll right? get bailed out. The SNL crisis, they got bailed out. That was the trick. They said these CDs are guaranteed by the government. Let's, let's, let's use the government as the backstop. Same thing in the 2008 crisis. Same thing with the FTX crisis. They're banking on the feds bailing them out. Is this guy in jail, even though he's patently... In a, so you're nationalizing the risk and privatizing the upside. Yeah, absolutely. But it's gone on for decades. And it gets worse and worse because, especially during an environment of the past 40 years where interest rates got cheaper and cheaper. So the basic fuel for financial fraud is cheap money. Yes. And the central bank, which is now, okay, reluctantly raising rates, they should have been raising rates years ago because that's the role of the central bank, price stability. And they needed to come in and proactively make sure that the malinvestment and the abuse was curtailed by making the cost of abuse and financial fraud high. That's what a higher interest rate does. If you have an idea like, oh, I'm Sam Bankman Fried, I'm going to create this $32 billion financial fraud, and I'm going to use borrowed money, which, by the way, the cost of that borrowed money is nothing. You know, there's no incentive not to do that. And right. if, I, if I mess up, I'm going to get bailed out. But if interest rates are 5%, now suddenly you have a barrier to your fraud. Right. So that's what interest rates, one of the roles that interest rates can do is it creates a barrier to entry for fraudsters. But if you keep it always at zero and getting lower, uh, you are inviting fraud. That's right. I say the big and crushing inflation. I mean, if you're taking the right. value out of money, I mean, well, the inflation, the inflation was building up over years. As you know, um, the inflation reporting under reports inflation 
by hedonic adjustments, uh, by constantly substituting in the basket right, of CPI right. for hamburger for meat. Uh, they'll say, well, your, your, your laptop, had the processor is twice as fast, so we're going to say that it's half as, uh, as, as expensive in the CPI index. They do stuff like that to keep it really low. Also, the cost of living adjustment, they need to keep inflation low because the feds don't want to pay that of to course. higher. So they artificially keep the CPI number as low as they possibly can. So meanwhile, all that money, which is the, the actual inflation, is building up in the, the asset prices. So the stock market, the real estate market, the chateau, mar you know, the chateaus in Switzerland market, the, all those things are up 15, 20 percent a year because of all that money that's being printed. Uh, until now in 2022, be, uh, you know, I mean, to be honest, it was when Russia invaded Ukraine that kind of called the time on this whole thing. You know, um, they essentially said, you know what? We're, we actually believe we are better at pricing oil than you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're pricing oil in Chicago, and it's totally manipulated. And, you know, we, since we're the producer, yeah, I think we'll price the oil from here on. And suddenly inflation went out of the roof because they took it out of the hands of the financiers. Right. Right. And now the pricing power for commodities in the world are with the producers. That means the BRICS. That means Russia. Of that course. means China. That means... Uh, Brazil, right? So that's where the that's where America now is in a real conundrum because how are they going to suddenly get out of this mess that they've created by lax financial oversight for 40 years? The Sam Bankman-Fried, as abhorrent and ridiculous as it is, he's actually just the tip of the iceberg. There is really, I always say that if you took fraud out of the American economy, there would be nothing left. It's an economy run almost entirely on fraud. And fraud is celebrated. Like uh, the, the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, people don't see that as a cautionary tale and they should avoid committing fraud. It's used as a playbook by this generation. Like, I'm going to steal whatever I can as fast as I can. That's the morals. That's the ethos you find. So you, you think the war in Ukraine was a pivot point yeah, because, in our economy? Yes. So what would explain the religious fervor with which the... With Wall Street and the Democratic Party and parts of the Republican Party are backing that war. Uh, at this point, you should put the meme up of uh, Zelensky at the laundromat. That, that's the appropriate yeah. meme at this point. It's, it's pure money laundering. It, it is, right? No question. The FTX is intimately involved. Without question. It, the, the, the facts, the figures, the numbers are quite plain to see for anyone. They needed money to launder. Uh, Ukraine is where they launder it. Uh, th less than 30% of the weapons actually make it to the battlefield. It, it, it's a complete and utter disgusting incidence of, of the elites in this country ripping people off uh, and calling it something, having something to do with an agenda. It's propaganda, okay? It's propaganda. Propaganda and money laundering, a, a, a kleptocracy. It, all these things are colliding, Tucker, and it's... On one hand, as, a, as, as somebody who's been in the industry for as long as I have, and as somebody who's almost like an aficionado of tracking all these various financial tricks and frauds over the years, because it's kind of interesting, it, it is, at the end of the day, kind of sad, because they are literally throwing the country under the bus at this point. I, I, I don't see how... The, this is why El Salvador has become the beacon. So El Salvador is now the shining city on the hill. El Salvador is now where hope lives in the world. Uh, because you have a president who recognized the potential of Bitcoin early, who recognized that everything else was garbage, and none of these scandals are hitting El Salvador right now. There's no FTX scandal. There's no Mike Novogratz. There's no Charles uh, Hoskinson. There's no Brock Pierce in El Salvador because he pushed them all out. And now uh, with the, they formally created a Bitcoin office. They formally created new securities laws, which will open the way for volcano bonds. So they're going to escape the IMF by producing their own uh, volcano bond financing mechanism, which I'm consulting on. What's a volcano bond? So you're tapping into geothermal energy to uh, reward investors with a Bitcoin dividend uh, via a bond offering, essentially is what it is. So it's a volcano-backed bond. And the, the proceeds are used to enhance their geothermal energy capacity because they have a lot of stranded energy. Uh, we already know it works because in Iceland, they developed a huge um, Bitcoin mining industry tapping into the Icelandic geothermal energy, of which they have a lot. Before, they, Iceland, uh, well, the way that they would export that energy is that they invited aluminum smelters to come like Alcoa, and they smelt aluminum in Iceland using the very cheap geothermal energy. Yes. Then they export that 
aluminum it takes enormous oxygen. energy to smelt metal. Right. So right. that's that's a GDP boost for Iceland by because they, they, they can't export the energy because energy degrades as you yes, leave the course. source. But if you create a, an aluminum ingot, you can export it. You see what I'm saying? So they turn geothermal into aluminum. Here in El Salvador, they're turning geothermal into Bitcoin, the hardest money known to, the, to, to man in history that gives financial freedom to all Salvadorans and anyone around the world and unconfiscatable, immutable, uncensorable money. And Bukele, President Bukele recognized that early. He's been tweeting about it since 2017. And he's, he's got a full Bitcoin plate, a full you know, agenda uh, which is in motion right now. So this is really happening. So El Salvador is really becoming a beacon of hope as in the American so dream dies. Because the coverage in the United States of Bukele in El Salvador in the last six months has been mocking. You went all in on Bitcoin and look what happened in Bitcoin. It dropped. But your vantage is different. Well, let, let's, let's, let's dig into the numbers for a second. So since making Bitcoin legal tender, GDP is up 10%. That's $2.8 So 560 million or so goes into the treasury. The paper loss of the Bitcoin is maybe 60 or 70 million. He's up half a billion on his Bitcoin if you do the full accounting. Uh, the numbers are startling. Now, I don't want to uh, get lost in my cards here, but let's take a look at this, Tucker. GDP up 10.3%. In, in El Salvador. Tourism up 52%. That's directly related to Bitcoin. Employment up 7%. Exports up 17%. In, internal revenue is up 37%. Not by raising taxes, but by shaming people to pay their taxes. The yeah. finance director goes on TV every Thursday and says, hey, you there, the grocery store chain, owner, you didn't pay your taxes. And they're like, oh, <laughs> you got me. It's really hilarious. They really do that? Yeah, it's like a game show. But if you didn't pay your taxes, you lose the game show. Uh, <laughs> no, really? Yeah. Minister Zelaya, this guy is the top finance minister in the world. I love this guy. And he goes on TV every week and shames people, the big titans of industry, who didn't pay their tax. And they rate their tax uh, collections are up 37%, right? Uh, violent crime. Wait, 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 without using guns or prison sentences, no. just by shaming people That's on TV. Right. And not raising taxes. I mean, imagine if you got people in America to pay their taxes. I mean, here's an argument that people say, well, you know, the rich in America pay most of the taxes. And, you know, that's true, but on reported taxes. <laughs> because once you get to a certain income plateau, you don't report. And yes. banks uh, advertise that service. They're like, okay, you know, well, we won't go down that rabbit hole right here. But here's another But people are not really paying their taxes here is bottom line. Exactly. There's like $22 trillion in a floating pool of money that is managed by the four big accounting firms. The biggest accounting firms in the world manage a $22 trillion pool of capital that has never been taxed and will never get taxed. And that pool continues to grow. And just kind of floats around. It floats around. In an untaxable space. From jurisdiction space. to that jurisdiction, through that loophole. through that. So the, the big four accounting firms are the biggest crooks. You know the names. You know who they are. The big four. Yeah. They are the biggest financial crooks in the world, by far. And, and, and if you wanted to reform this whole system, you would start there. Those four big four are where you would start. But let's look at violent crime, down 95% in El Salvador. 95%. They've gone from the murder capital of the world to the safest country in Latin America. I live there. I live in San Salvador with my wife, Stacy, And... The, the absolute, it's like people after victory in Europe day, you know, those scenes of people kissing in the street and yeah. being happy. That's the way Salvadorans are. They're like, we're free. We're on the street. We're at a party. We're surfing. We're at the museum. They're like literally having a street party 24 seven because they got rid of all the gangs that were incidentally exported from Los Angeles. I MS-13 know. is from Los Angeles. No, that's real. Right. That's I not know. domestically grown. That was Bill Clinton. Who, who let them all out of jail and sent them back to El Salvador. Okay, so, and then you have human rights organizations saying, well, you know, these criminals, these MS-13 guys, uh, they're not getting due process. Well, the fact is that the human rights of 7 million Salvadorans, I think, come first, number one. And number two, when you have an, an infestation of crime at that level, look at what countries do. In America, during the 1930s, you had organized crime. And what did America do? What did the feds do? They were like, you know what? We need a special police force to go in with special rights 
to deal with this extraordinary problem of the Chicago gang violence. That special force was called the Federal Bureau of in Investigation. And you also had a guy named Elliot Ness. Remember him? The Untouchables. Of course. And because it was so corrupt that they couldn't find a single person to, who wasn't corrupt. And it became a legend. The guy who couldn't be corrupted. So President Bukele is Elliot Ness. President Bukele is the, is the guy who said, enough is enough. We are drawing the line in the sand no more. And violent crime is, is down 95%. The numbers are there. And as a result, the, the, the criminals in El Salvador were extorting from the population of 7 million people at a GDP of, 30, of 28 billion. They were extorting $6 billion a year in a $28 billion economy. Oh. So by getting rid of... Just hemorrhaging money. Just so. hemorrhaging money. $6 billion a year. 20% of GDP. So then uh, by getting rid of the crime, right, you feel like a 20% tax cut or a 20% tax abatement or 20, it's a gift. Yeah. So like the local pupusa seller, you know, they sell pupusas, which are the local cuisine. I don't know if you've tasted one I have, in yeah. El Salvador. But uh, there's 5,000 pupusa sellers in the country, mostly women. And um, I went to my local pupusa seller and she said, oh, I said, I didn't order extra cheese. She said, no, no. Uh, I, I, this is the way it is now because I have extra money and I just hired somebody to work with me. So the account, now multiply that times 7 million people. And you end up with a GDP up 10.3% in the last year. It's probably going to be double digits against, again this year. By simply empowering people to work hard, keep their money, get rid of the gangs, and with Bitcoin added to the mix, this is another thing. If you have Bitcoin, you're giving people the ability to opt out of the system and have the wealth that's unconfiscatable, it's their own wealth, nobody can touch it. It's not like the bank where they routinely will, in the U.S., as you know, they will use uh, the powers of the state to, when, when Julian Assange, for example, was trying to get funding, the state came in, or Visa, or PayPal, or MasterCard, they froze all those accounts. Oh, or yeah. The U.S. Uh, froze Russian uh, assets and to, the, to the tune of billions, uh, simply, or, you know, capriciously, one would say. But you're using the, the dollar as a weapon. So you're not really free if you're in a dollar system, because the state can use it as a weapon against you at any time. CBDCs are an extension of the weaponization of so, the So I wanted to get to that. Um, I don't know if we have the clip, but the new prime minister of Great Britain uh, just, came on, just came on television. Sunak is his name. That's exactly right. Sunak. Who Rishi, himself, Rishi Sunak. Who himself is um, you know, a billionaire through his wife, uh, came on television and made the case that central bank digital currencies are coming and they're going to make your life way, way better. Um, and made a kind of compelling case for them. They're more energy efficient, he said. Unlike most of the digital money people use daily today, it would be issued directly by a central bank, like the Bank of England in the UK. The central bank digital currency was effectively, they're going to bypass the banking system. One of the reasons why they're doing this is because the banks once again need to be bailed out. But the feds are going to let the banks swing in the wind, and they're going to go directly to consumer, and you're going to get your money directly from the central bank. So the big banks on Wall Street who are looking for a bailout this time, they're going to be surprised. They're going to be, they're going to be left to rot. They're not going to be bailed out this time. The Fed's going to say, you're out. We're going to go directly to consumer. Here's a CBDC. Now, the problem is, of course, that it's programmable money. It's centralized money. It's no different than fiat money. And the tricks that you can do with it are insanely and dystopian. For example, and we already know this is happening in China. They already have an aversion of this, social credit scores, et cetera. But, you know, for example, you know, you'll get your CBDC and uh, it'll say uh, it's good for until 2024, February of 2024. And then this this money that you just earned it expires, it expires. Why would they do that? Because they want you to spend it as quickly as possible and they don't want you to save your money. If you save money and you're a sovereign individual, you're dangerous to them. So they don't want anyone saving money. They want people to spend money, and they want people to spend money as fast as they can. So this CBDC, programmable money from the central bank, will have an expiration date, like a frequent flyer mile. Number two, it'll be tied through vast databases to your behavior. So if you're antisocial, according to them, then you will lose privileges. You know, passport could get canceled, or you are suddenly, uh, you can't book a flight, or you're any number of ways to manage you socially. Uh, and they do that through 
through a central bank digital currency, which is tied to all the databases, and all the databases are connected. One of the interesting aspects of our modern life is that all the technological aspects of our life, the, the, the three primary drivers of technology are bandwidth, CPU, and storage, right? Bandwidth being the cost to send uh, uh, data, the storage or memory, and the CPU, the calculations, the processing unit. Yes. All three of those components are constantly crashing to the point of zero. The Moore's law and other technological laws that suggest that the cost of managing these vast databases gets cheaper and cheaper in, by magnitudes, yes. in very high magnitudes. So the CBDC will be tied into essentially a database which will have an enormous amount of information about you. And, um, and it's very cheap to run this. And somebody, some bureaucrat, you know, potentially in another country on their app on their phone will be like, oh, Tucker Carlson, oh, uh, during the hurricane, you didn't take out your garbage. I'm going to have to cancel your passport. Bop, done. Then there's no accountability. There's no recourse for you um, because that would cause another demerit on your system. And you, so that's just, you're describing slavery. It is slavery. Humanity has fought against tyranny our entire existence on this planet as humanity. And there have been achievements for us to escape tyranny. In the United States, with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, was a high watermark yes. in having a tyranny-free life. Uh, but that has been undermined uh, by essentially the central banks, who invited people like Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX to play in a playground called free money, no accountability, and um, these fraudulent tokens that are being used to launder excessively without any uh, re repercussions whatsoever. So why is Bitcoin, just circling back to yeah. the beginning, why oh, By is the way, I have a column in this, this month's uh, Bitcoin magazine, you know, the one with President Bekele in the cover. Yes. Now, the, on this page is my column. I have a regular column. Okay, now next month he won't be on the cover, but I will still have a column. <laughs> okay. Now, this column... I believe that's a Winston Churchill quote. <laughs> yes. This column is entitled, Who is the Banana Republic Now, Bitch? Okay? So for your Fox listeners out there who might be a bit, you know, taken aback by use of this profanity, all I can say is read the story first and save judgment until later. Well, so actually, I was going to ask you one question. I'm pivoting to another, which has been in my head. There you go. Bless you. Since we had dinner with President Bukele, uh this summer, yes, I was so impressed by his depth and thoughtfulness. Um, really impressed. Smartest president I've ever interviewed by far. But what, if all the countries in the world, the hundreds of countries in the world, pick one that leads the Bitcoin revolution, and it's El Salvador. Why El Salvador? Small country, famously dangerous, agrarian. Like it seems like the last place that would adopt Bitcoin. Right. There was a parlor game by folks in the Bitcoin community to figure out what country would be first to make Bitcoin legal standard. And El Salvador's name never came up. <laughs> no, 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 not surprisingly. Right? And uh, I think it's well, what happened was that in a community called El Zante, which is their beach community on the coast, a very magnanimous, benevolent Bitcoiner gifted $100,000 of the Bitcoin to that community to create uh, a circular economy of people just using Bitcoin because there's a lot of surfers. And they couldn't have access to cash um, because the nearest ATM was five miles away. And they needed a, some currency that would work for everybody. Because if you show up with euros and dollars and yen, it doesn't work, right? And so Bitcoin is that universal currency. So they said, let's make a community that's going to run on Bitcoin, a, a Bitcoin standard here in El Zante, the surfing community. Okay. So then what happened is that Jack Mahlers, who runs a company called Strike in Chicago, noticed that his app, which is a Bitcoin app called Strike, was getting 20,000 downloads a day. And it was like the growth was off the chart. And he's like, what is going on? So he goes and he visits with President Bukele. And he explains really the whole story in terms of not only, you know, kind of enhancing what the president already kind of knew about Bitcoin, even when he was mayor in San Salvador, he was tweeting about it. So he, he was aware of it. Uh, and from there, he said, you know what, let's roll this out across the country, make Bitcoin legal tender in El Salvador. What did Salvadorans think of this? Well, at, I mean, at first, it's, of course, um, brand new. I mean, Yeah, like, what are you talking about? I mean, this oh, is a brand dude. new thing. Um, and it's, but it, it, the president has such incredible goodwill for all the things that he's yes. doing that um, Salvadorans are 
uh, open to these ideas. And certainly with everything we've just described, that's why his popularity is 90, 95% for his reelection. Here's the reelection cap, Bukele in 2024. It's uh, Dios, Union, Libertad, and Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. So God. That's for you too. See that all these unity, talking, look, freedom, and Bitcoin. I mean, all I got from you so far was part of your set broke down my foot, <laughs> and it was a piece of pine wood. That's all I'll I be, got. I'll be wearing. And the this. toilet didn't work. Okay, what am I getting from you? No, this is nothing, not half nothing, as glamorous nothing. as they claim it is, as you've learned the hard way. Um, <laughs> so how? But okay. There's going to be, in the wake of FTX, I know everyone's ignoring it in favor of all these other stories because the media doesn't want to face the fact they promoted this and they abetted it uh, and they should be ashamed of themselves. But at some point, this is going to be at the center of our attention again as the downstream effects become obvious and, and other companies fail because of FTX's failure. Will that failure be used to try and crush Bitcoin, do you think? Well, it gets back to what I said at the very beginning, Tucker, and that is Bitcoin is designed to be attacked. Um, the more you attack it, the stronger it gets because the hashing algorithm that's at the core of the technology is um, increased by all of these folks trying to get into the system and attack the system, which makes it more secure, which makes the price go up. So we want, it, we, I all, you know, we want people to attack Bitcoin. It attracts people attacking it. But what if the U.S. government attacks Bitcoin by regulating the exchanges or by making it illegal to use it as, as currency? It's, it's the U.S. government's game to lose. The U.S. government has a choice. Either they can make Bitcoin legal tender and start stacking Bitcoin like the president of El Salvador, who's had an enormous Bitcoin-related gift and his economy is now the shining city on the hill, or they can try to regulate Bitcoin and attack Bitcoin and be left out of the 21st century financial revolution that is Bitcoin. There, there's going to be opposition. I want to play you a clip of Elizabeth Warren, who, as you know, was a Harvard professor, so she's way smarter than you. Talking about Bitcoin. Yeah, okay. There's Elizabeth Warren. If I buy Bitcoin, am I buying a share of stock? Or am I buying a pork belly? Or am I buying uh, euros? Or am are I buying? you buying air? Oh, wow. Okay, you're going in. <laughs> what I'm is going it? going in. Yeah, what is because it? Because that's the point, is that it's, uh, you're buying something that other people believe either is going to go up in value, presumably that's why you're buying it, or think it's going to go down in value, which is presumably why someone else is selling it. But that's it. It's a, it's a bet on whether this, this thing, this uh, ephemeral token, will become more valuable or less valuable. Now, why would Elizabeth Warren uh, hate Bitcoin so much? Like, why does she care? Because... Um Anything that gets in the way of her getting the stream of money being printed by the feds is seen as an enemy to her. Yeah. Right? So she is a beneficiary of the fiat money system. And that's right now in which is a heavily democratic composition to the political establishment here in the United States. This is kind of a they they believe deeply in the sanctity of Keynesian economics and money printing and uh, spend and debt, right? They don't they don't believe in the soundness of that money should be sound in any way, uh, like it's in the Constitution. It should be gold uh, is right there in the Constitution because it's sound, scarce commodity money. So politically, it, may, it makes sense that she would not be in favor of something that would interrupt her ability to get in the middle of trying to direct that flow of cash to causes that are good, even if, they, if, if they're, the economics of it are nonsensical and don't make sense. So she's a problem in terms of she promotes the boondoggles. She promotes the, the malinvestment. She promotes the, everything that's wrong with the fiat money system. So she would be a natural enemy of Bitcoin. Her remedy of somehow regulating Bitcoin is fallacious and a non-starter because Bitcoin is already self-regulated. Bitcoin is the most regulated technology that's ever existed. It's called the consensus protocol that runs the 
the centerpiece of the technology itself. The only thing about it is that it exists completely outside of anyone's control. Does it? So that's the question. Does it? Yes. When, and that, to me, is as a non-finance person, but someone interested in the political economy yeah. and freedom, that was the promise always of Bitcoin. It exists outside the control of the worst people in the world. But then you saw the trucker strike in Canada last winter, and the Canadian government froze people's Bitcoin? No, the Bitcoin continued on as it normally does. But the on-ramps and the off-ramps and how to get access to Bitcoin and bank accounts associated with Bitcoin would, could be interrupted. And right. that's what happened. And um, so this is, where, this is why, particularly during this FTX scandal, people are on, that have money on these exchanges are, are taking them off the exchanges and putting them into self-custody. Uh, with uh, like a, a ledger cold storage wallet or a cold right. storage wallet. People have lots of money on these exchanges, and that's really, you don't want these money on, any money on those exchanges. You need to take personal um, delivery, if you will, of that money and keep it completely outside of anyone's uh, how, how complicated is that? Well, um, like any technology, with each iteration, it gets simpler and simpler. So I work with a company called Swan Bitcoin, for example, and um, they have an app. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very easy. You know, when I started back in 2011, it was very difficult to kind of manage Bitcoin. When it was a dollar and it was on, you know, it was very difficult to manage. But over now we're at a point in 2022 where the user interface of Bitcoin is now very easy. I mean, you can take your Bitcoin uh, off uh, an exchange and put it into a cold storage or put it into a, a safe place easily within, uh, you know, less than a minute. So it's very easy to do. You have to have the people don't, you know, it's not natural for people to think that they they would want to have this Bitcoin completely under their self custody because there's a lot of responsibility with that. People are grown up with the idea that banks are safe and institutions are safe and I don't need to worry about it. But we're at a point in history where you do need to worry about it and banks are not safe. And if you have, and, and gold, by the way, is also highly problematic in this scenario because it's not easy to move around. It's centralized and it can be seized and easily seized. We already had that in the United States. Whereas Bitcoin, you cannot seize Bitcoin. It's unseizable. And if I have a 12 word a seed phrase that I've memorized, I can literally go through the airport naked uh, and go to anywhere in the world and have access to any amount, billions of dollars in Bitcoin. And nobody can stop me from that. And if I'm not welcome in this country and I'm going to be harassed by Elizabeth Warren and she believes that she knows how to run an economy better than market forces, then I would, uh, I'm living in El Salvador. So, yeah, so that's that, why I'm that, living that, in El I will, Salvador. I, will, I don't live in this country. Oh. I live in El Salvador, which is the shining hill now. It's the hope. It's in El Salvador. Why are you even here? You're at the end of an island. There's nobody here. It's just you and a bunch of birds. Like you're all alone to escape the madness. Why don't you just leave and go to El Salvador and be a free man? Okay, so, so that, that's my last question. And I want to hear about this in some greater detail. So you're very American. You're from this country. You're from New that's York. Right. You were educated here. You my family was here York. 300 years ago. Really? Yeah. We were in Philadelphia. We were one of the first publishers of the, uh, the Continental Congress. That made, you know, I'm as American as apple pie and, um, you know, baseball. Me too. But... Um, you know, I, enough is enough. I like I have a certain will and soul and need to be free. And if the Elizabeth Warrens of this world are going to lock me up in a digital CBDC prison, I'm saying I'm, I'm opting out. I'm taking my Bitcoin grenade. I'm putting it where the sun don't shine. And I'm saying, adios, Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm out of here. That's me. <laughs> I'm out. I'm not taking her anymore. So what's it like? What's it like as someone who is that rooted in America? Yeah to not live in America anymore? It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really? It's easier than you would think. Yeah, really? because you don't realize how messed up things are here until you leave. And then you're like, you know what? I'm here, I'm in the so-called third world country, but the people I meet are hardworking, entrepreneurial, friendly people. The president has everyone's interest at heart. Everyone's on the same team. And I, it's very easy to live there. In the U.S., it's, it's a struggle every, every turn because everything has been totally politicized. Everything's been financialized. Um, and they're bringing in CBDCs and everyone's going to be in prison. It's going to be an open air prison. And I mean, I think I'm going to, I wish everyone would get on a Bitcoin standard, take deliver, possession of their own assets. It's a rug pull on the system. Bitcoin is, is the ultimate form of, of, of defiance. It's the Boston Tea Party of our century. It's the, um, 
the the Getty's, you know, it's it's the ultimate American act. There's nothing more American than Bitcoin because it snubs it's your nose at authority. This is the as quintessential American is to essentially say we're ungovernable. We're not part of your empire. We're not part of your 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 top down system. We are individually governed ourselves and we have values. But if you're going to take those away, then we'll we'll leave and we'll start a new America. We'll start our America somewhere else. It's an idea. It doesn't have to be in frickin' Chicago. It can be in San Salvador. I'm still American, but I'm in San Salvador because I've got my Bitcoin, which is the most American thing ever invented. It's, it's an American invention, and it's changing the world, and it's changing our species in, in that we're evolving toward a more benevolent... It's, it, here's something that I've told the president to, face-to-face. It monetizes peace and love, and it demonetizes hate and war. Because if I have wealth that's unconfiscatable, no amount of coercion or violence is going to work. You can't get my Bitcoin. So you've got to come with me with something else in a peaceful way. If everyone is on a peace standard, which is Bitcoin, there's no violence. Okay, what if you took violence out of the American system? Well, 50% of my taxes goes to the Pentagon. America's the most violent global threat by a factor of 100. There's nobody that comes close. How many military bases do we have around the world? 700 or more? That costs us 50 cents of every tax dollar. Imagine if all that money went back into the economy. That's extortion. It's an extortion racket, right? So we saw in El Salvador, if you take the extortion money away, it, it thrives. You, the people know what to do with, by for the benefit of themselves. They know how to work. If El Salvador continues to thrive, I mean, that is, as you said, a huge middle finger to the people participating in the other global systems. Yep. So, and El Salvador is a very small country with no, it's got a Navy, but like no real military. Like you could, why wouldn't they just blow up El Salvador? Well, um, I think that um, what we're scrambling and doing in El Salvador is converting the region. So yep. the, there's four, there's five countries in Central America. So the other four are being worked on <laughs> right now. Yep. Uh, Guatemala looks like it's in play for a Bitcoin standard. Uh, so we're talking about a trillion dollar part of the world, 60 million people in total. And also now that's going over to Mexico. Once you get Mexico on board, you've got a huge fat part of the global economy. I, it's, it's kind of a foot race. I think we're, we're, the idea is to get enough of the globe on a Bitcoin standard really before somebody in Washington decides to do something really, really stupid. And I think that they're so preoccupied with the collapse of the institutions and the banks and the Sam Bankman frees and the political dysfunction and everything that's going on that they're distracted. And, and I think that we're going to be able to make it. I think we're going to be, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make it, Tucker. I Are think. there other Americans there? Yeah, there's a lot of Americans there. People, a lot of young families, because the, it's, it's the, the, they like the values. The families that I talk to, young families with kids, they're like, we're sick of the leftist agenda in America. We don't yeah. want our kids going to no. schools with all that crazy psychodrama that's happening in, in schools. So they're moving to El Salvador where there's a very strong family value and there's opportunity. They're rebuilding the country almost from scratch. And if you have any skills at all, you can work. Uh, you have the, the cost of living is, is cheap. Uh, you know, food is pretty cheap. Housing is pretty cheap. You can live a decent life as a hard worker uh, there. And it's growing quite rapidly. They're building Bitcoin City in the east, which, again, will do a bond, hopefully, some kind of bond offering to fund Bitcoin City as well as other. I just heard today, uh, by the way, that the president, Bukele, you know, he retired some of the nation's debt outstanding external debt. He just announced today he's getting rid of it all. They're going to get rid of all their external debt. Seriously? Yeah. So that's another... How many countries in the world can say that? Um, very few are heading in that direction. The, the, the trend is overwhelmingly in the opposite direction. The, the globe is... Uh, there's, uh, on a, the, the world is, is 300% debt to GDP for planet Earth. Whoa. So like in Japan, it's over 300%. In the U.S., you know, we topped 100%. So on average, it's 300% at the planet Earth, debt to GDP. El Salvador is going the complete opposite direction because they don't want to have any ties to these, or these banks and the IMF and the others. 
and, and they've got the cash to do it. They're, they're thriving. They're making money. Uh, and if you have a, a government that is um, doing their job and by just recycling, making, creating opportunities, it's equal opportunities there, not equal outcomes. The President Bukele has said that. It's a speech that could have been lifted from an American leader I was about to say. decades ago. I think of him as kind of like Steve, uh, JFK meets Steve Jobs, and you end up with President Bukele. He's got the charisma of JFK and the, the intelligence and the vision and the ability to lift up. Remember JFK got people going to the Peace Corps? Oh, yeah. And it was like, you know, do something for your country. And people listened to that. And there was a huge movement uh, in that time. And then, of course, Steve Jobs is just somebody who's a visionary who can look at a lot of different things simultaneously and come up with a, with a, with a product in mind. And President Bukele is um, the ability to assimilate vast quantities of information and, and, and understand how to implement that and delegate and to move the, the agenda of getting people uh, better off today than they were before moving. And it's, it's the execution of it is... It's happening, and the numbers bear that out. That's to, to just look at the numbers. It's just, just, it's just there. Why can't we do that here? It's just that we're in a late stage of our development. It's become very decadent in America, and um, I, I, don't, I, I think that we've, we've kind of run out of gas. We're just tired. I think we're just, yeah. after being on the, the top spot for 100 years, I think we're just, we're just done. We're just toast. We're just like, we give up. They're giving up. That's my, everyone, when I'm here, I get a sense of defeat. When I'm in El Salvador, I feel a sense of opportunity, and we're at the beginning of an incredible uh, new era. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm actually, if I had to say it, you know, I mean, I became a stockbroker during the early Reagan years. So I'm, I'm, you know, I have an affinity for Reagan and his ability to communicate. It's a new day in America and everything that he was, as the great communicator that he was, um, that set the stage for a a couple of decades that were very well economically positioned and unleashed a lot of entrepreneurialism in America. But it's, it's just gone into a retreat, really. It's yeah, gone into retreat. It has. Max, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciated that. I can sense, I can sense it. I mean, well, this is real. probably the best interview and most enjoyable interview you've had in maybe three or four years. <laughs> I, would I feel would that. definitely say that's uh, right. In that's that rate, I'm going to check my records, but I would definitely. Uh, I feel it. I just, I just sense it. I, in that the face, right? I'm reading like, thank God I finally got to have this interview because it's, it's so interesting to me. Very Tucker few Carlson. people bring plastic grenades to the interview, <laughs> and I will, I will cherish this. Well, that's great. And don't forget the hat and the magazine. I love it. And plus, uh, we were charged six dollars at the toll on the bridge to get to your deserted <laughs> Gilligan's Island studio <laughs> on the edge of the universe, the edge where that is nobody lives here. Okay, I pulled the pin, baby. I want that six dollars back. <laughs> by the way, should have paid in Bitcoin. <laughs> Max Kaiser is the name of the guest. You knew that. Tucker Carlson is the name of the show. New episode three days a week at Fox Nation. We'll see you every week at eight p.m. on the Fox News Channel.